Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris on today's Australian Open finals catch up. Sinner wins his first slam from two sets down. Sabalenka defends Melbourne title. And Rohan Bopana becomes the oldest ever player to secure a major. Kim, Chris, today is the 28th of January and we are here to catch up on the finals of the Australian Open at Tennis Weekly HQ. Yannick Sinner secures his first ever Grand Slam singles title. Arena Sabalenka defends her AO title and Rohan Bapana becomes the oldest ever player at 43 years young to win a Grand Slam title. A lot of feel-good stories, it feels like, this weekend. So many feel-good stories. And we have to say it's not 43 years old. It's level 43 <laughs> is how he's to <laughs> himself. So, like, I think we're all over level 30. So we're doing pretty well in that respect. We are indeed. Su Wei Shea also doing pretty well as I think level 38. Uh, so, oh, wow. and Yannick Sinner's, well, he's way down at level, I don't know, he's so 22? young. 22, yeah. 22. Level is the new age. <laughs> level is the new age. And uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be getting on to level 34 in the next couple of months. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely of that mindset as well. But guys, it's a very exciting time at Tennis Weekly HQ this evening because it's actually a part of history because this is our first ever round by round slam recording that is on video might be our last if it doesn't go well guys <laughs> <laughs> at least well, viewers... un unless my must mustache hasn't put you all i off. was gonna say at least viewers can finally see the tash that's been talked about mm. so much as well as your background joel you're representing the podcast with there's a tote bag over your right shoulder <laughs> And a white base and, and the white tennis weekly baseball cap, which is on oh, wow on on the other side. So uh, yeah, it's, arranged. it's it's almost kind of like the most. It's like the easiest. It's like the tennis weekly equivalent of where's Wally. It's a bit uh, like QVC maybe QVC. Yeah, <laughs> QVC. Wow, you can dial this number we, to purchase hmm. something. There's nothing to purchase on mine. I've I've gone for Scandi minimalism, <laughs> and actually I'm we not wearing. We don't exactly do cap. subtle marketing, do we? No, we no. don't. No, never. No, Links in the description. You have got a tennis cap. Oh, yeah, yes. I like I like your cap, uh, Chris. It says it's the cool stands. The cool stands. Very, so very novel. There. If you do like it, and you do come and watch us on YouTube, where this episode will be, um, if you like the cap, then we can actually maybe make it in the next merch drop. Um, this was Alina, our producer's wonderful uh, idea for the cool stands. Um, but I guess that doesn't happen that much anymore. It's a bit of a relic in case you know challenges and ele electronic line calling will do away with it. Well, well, I mean, we've got the video, we've got the video up and running. And also it's going to be historic because we're going to be doing a Vegemite taste test at the yeah. end of this episode. So everyone hold up your jars of Vegemite. Get the, Here we go. There we go. We're I'm ready nervous. For the best. A, lot of, a lot of history. A spoon is I mean, ready. Sorry, a lot, of, a lot also... of stories already to just get three jars of Vegemite, it feels like. Well, in Copenhagen, <laughs> that was a real challenge. I had to go to the, the mega candy store, it was called. But I'm enjoying a hot Vegemite now. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> well, we're going to end. I love end. how Vegemite's candy over there. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm still trying to understand that. But yeah, we're going to be taking a spoonful of Vegemite to end our AO coverage at the end of the episode. So stay tuned for that. But Kim, we've got to, we've got to talk the tennis now, don't we? Yeah, it isn't the Vegemite Weekly podcast, <laughs> no. sadly. Uh, sadly. I'd love it. Some. Uh, <laughs> we do have a lot of tennis to talk about. Uh, namely Yannick Sinner winning his very first Grand Slam title, not just in, you know, standard routine fashion, but from two sets down. I thought, I thought when Medvedev kind of clinched that second set today, I thought, oh, poor Sinner, you know, he's done really well beating Djokovic, got to the final, but, you know, he's just that, that, that bit too nervy, hasn't quite managed to assert himself and good on Daniel Medvedev you know he's come all this way through fought his battles and here he is finally getting the title at last but I was very wrong to assume that because it all went uh the other way around in the end didn't it I Joel. knew Kim I knew as well remember my prediction I'm gonna get in early and make that clear I was never in doubt at two sets down I mean you, you can you be definitely fully smug can now. have the smug you can definitely have the smug hat on with being the only person to With predict a Yannick on. Sinner. <laughs> yeah, predicting Yannick Sinner to win because, yeah, it was an incredible, incredible effort, wasn't it, from from two sets down. It was almost kind of a, a match of, of two halves. And it's it sort of left me in this position of, as much as I'm really happy for, for Yannick Sinner winning his his first Grand Slam title and the the momentum and the waves that he's he's been on, certainly over the last six months or so, 
I'm also devastated for for Daniel Medvedev mm. at the same time. I mean, two Australian Open finals he has now been in when he's been leading two sets up. This match, Rafa Nadal as well, and he's lost both of them. It is very, very gutting, isn't it? Kim's not he's too the first gutted player. with the Nadal result, though, are you? <laughs> well, no, I wasn't gutted from then. No offence, uh, Med- Medvedev. But yeah, he's the first player to have lost two Grand Slam singles finals from two sets up in the Open era. Uh, which is not a great wow. record you want to have. Uh, but I mean, maybe that's better than him getting like obliterated in all of them. At least he had his chances. But then, you know, you end up dwelling and ruining on them way more, don't you? Uh, but he said, you know, he's going to try to be a bit more positive in how he reacts to this. Because I think last uh, the last time round, you know, two years ago against Rafa, he said he, he had a terrible season afterwards. And I think it just really set the, the tone for the rest of the year. So I think he's learned from how he handled it the last time. So at least, you know, hopefully we'll see him not let it get to him um, and he's going to sort of take the positives from the situation at the very least. Yeah, I think he, he has to because he did so well to make it this far. He's played so much tennis. I think there were some of those the stats that came out. He spent 24 hours of the last two weeks on court, which is kind of crazy when you think about it in terms of how long he was playing those matches. And I think it was the record for most sets played um, in a Grand Slam by a single player in the Open Era, 31 um, sets of tennis. So, I mean, it's probably all the more heartbreaking given just how much he put into this and just how much he kind of had turned around that Zverev match to get the win, to get up and really have opportunities to potentially take it in three. Um, it's got it's got a sting, especially when you're that tired from all of that exertion. Um, to keep kind of a very positive frame of mind like he did do and impress, there's reports that he was much more upbeat than you would think. Um, it just is a testament to his character because I don't think he does have a mentality issue. I think really he maybe had a tactical issue is what I'd say, where he was playing very kind of far up the court compared to some of his previous matches and very aggressive tennis in those first two sets of tennis. And, and as soon as he kind of backed off a little bit, Sinner was allowed to step in. And then I think that's when it really changed because if you let Sinner have a swing, then you're going to be doing an awful lot of running. And when you've been running for 24 hours, you might you might not be able to make it through that final set. Why do you think he backed off? Because it was clearly a tactic that was working really well in those first two sets. You know, he came out super aggressive and just, you know, by far the better player. Sinner wasn't really able to play his game. And I just thought, yes, Medvedev's got it so right. And then, you know, why, why did he kind of back off? Was it, was it complacency? Was it nerves? I think the serve was working a lot better in the first couple of sets. Um, I think he was winning around 87% um, of points behind it. And he had over 80% of first serves in, I believe. So that really does help you get up the court immediately. Um, and when you get into some of the more difficult stages of the matches, then sometimes the serve goes and sometimes you do start to back off and you do start to hope that your opponent misses more than you play aggressively. And He's not naturally an aggressive baseliner. That's not necessarily how we would describe right. Daniel Medvedev. He so wants he to was... stay as far back behind the court as possible. I mean, if he could extend it further backwards, he'd be <laughs> in the stands <laughs> happily. Um, so I think it's just he was playing outside of his normal game plan. And you have to be really, really strict with yourself um, and really believe that it's going to work. And maybe he kind of defaulted to maybe the factory Medvedev setting rather than it kind of be a, a backing off and in a, in a bigger sense. But I mean... It was a great tactic. It's a shame that it didn't kind of deliver the whole way through the match. I I also think, you know, just as you said, the amount of hours that he spent on course, I think it was on court, it was six hours more than Yannick Sinner had been on court to get to get to the final. And again, the longer that match went on, it just showed. And you sort of felt that Daniel Medvedev, he needed to get that done in three because the longer and longer it was going to drag out, the more and more that, that balance of power was going to shift towards Yannick Sinner. And I do think, you know, that was, I think that was plain to see. But also when you did get to the start of that fourth set, you were also thinking about the the history and that Nadal match. And you wondered, was that creeping in um, into his mind as well? Because he's been here before and, you know, seemingly had the the championship on his racket and he's let it slip. And he's he's now, yeah, unfortunately, he's now done that again. I mean, I, I, it can't not have crossed his mind. Mm. You know, we, it crossed all of our minds. So it, it's, mm. it's absolutely got to have played, I think, some some factor. But I mean, full credit to Yannick Sinner because he turned it around. Like he's definitely proven his his 
his his worth at <laughs> this slam because he's come through comfortably in, in pretty much all his matches. He's knocked out the defending champion, the world number one, the 10 time champion. And then when his, you know, he was up against it two sets down, he's really proven himself today because, you know, he, he's managed to win, you know, from all kind of positions. And just, you know, obviously as the match went on, he was by far the fresher, which definitely helped physically. But Joel, what was it that Sinner did to change his his tactics, his mind his mindset to get back in to the match today? What what was the kind of critical thing that you think turned it around for him? Well, I think first of all, those first two sets, it almost felt like he was he was playing with nerves and he was playing with knowing that there was a lot of expectation on him. It was his you first know, the, final as well. Yeah, first final. Yeah, exactly. He had defeated Novak Djokovic, you know, the king of, of Rod Laver Arena, it, it, it feels like, um, in, in the semifinals as well. I, I wondered if that was like, you know, putting him, a, a putting huge kind of pressure on him. And as a result, it didn't really help, you know, his his play on the court because he was making some very unca- uncharacteristic, um, you know, errors you know, on the on the on the baseline baseline exchanges with Medvedev, and um, I think in terms of changing it around, I think you know in that third set, his mentality was just like I need to go out, I need to, I don't want to, I don't want to die wandering, I don't want to go out on the court and not having produced you know some of my best tennis, and maybe he sensed you know with Medvedev, um, you know speaking to his his team as well, it was kind of like. Look, the more I can push this guy, the more I, lo- the longer I can put him on the tennis court, that is going to favor me. So I wondered if he was kind of like, well, actually, let's let's make him really, really work for this because I haven't made him work for these first two sets. Let's make sure I make him work for it in that third set, which is what he did, and uh, that was for me how he got uh, back into the match. You have to hang in there, don't you, and hope that mm. Medvedev can't keep that level up. And I think uh, one of his coaches said that at 5-1 in that second set when um, Sinner then broke back, I think that's when Sinner's belief really changed because um, he got that break that he needed and that momentum started to shift a bit. And I think that's probably, if you are a great player and you do hang in there, you know that you get opportunities. Um, but the bit, I mean, for me, the big difference is the Sinner that we saw last year. I mean, I, I can't believe someone sent me kind of the Altmaier score at like five hours and you know, and it's unbelievable that he would go from sort of that level of tennis where he could almost mm. lose to any, anybody if it started to go off the boil and it wasn't going his way. And the unforced errors would really be leaking to today where it's almost like he had this sort of like quiet inner confidence that he still believed he could do it. And you look at some of the matches he's played at Grand Slams. I mean, last year, fourth round of the US Open, he lost to Zverev. And I had just got some of these numbers up because I thought it'd be quite interesting to see. And he hit 50 winners and 67 unforced errors. Um, and seven double faults in that match. And so you can just see that there's definitely a case that in these pressure moments, he's coming up with the goods much more. Um, And I think that's probably the biggest change because we've always known he had the game. Um, And you just don't know if on the day you're able to Mm. play, as you say, play your best game, but it's best of five, thank goodness. So he was able to get through in the end. And he's brought Darren Cahill into the fold, uh, you know, recently. Do you think that's been quite a pivotal factor? Do Do you think that's made the difference into how he's been playing you know, over the last kind of six months or so. I mean, not forgetting, the only person he has lost to in this period is was Novak Djokovic and everyone else he's he's won. You know, he's won 20 of his past 21 matches and that includes, you know, against top, lots, lots of top five opponents. He hasn't been playing, you know, journeymen of the tour. He's been right up there delivering against the very best. So do you think, you know, Darren Cahill was the kind Cahill of effect. bringing him in? Is, is that mm-hmm. kind of like being the ultimate factor here? I mean, he is a top class coach. He's he knows how to bre- he he knows how to develop players and coach into a grand, winner. Yeah. yeah, into Grand Slam winners. Uh, I think I was reading earlier. Every player he has now coached has won a Grand Slam title. So he's obviously got the he's obviously got the recipe down. And you've got someone like Yannick Sinner, a player. You know, you say we've we've been impressed with him. He's such an interesting guy, and I think he's always willing to learn. And he's always open to hearing you know, advice from from his team and from everyone around him. So I do think it takes it takes both of them. But certainly having someone with the expertise of, of Dan Cahill, it's going to help. And the right team. Yeah. I think that's also mm. true. We should definitely make it clear that he does have um, other coaches as well. Like he does have um, Vagnozzi as someone else that he works with. And uh, they've been working together for a long period of time. So he has this sort of Italian setup. And Cahill's kind of been the perfect addition to it, I think, in terms of some of that sort of maybe, as you say, experience of kind of creating champions. And Mm. that really has let him 
kind of grow much more. And I think sometimes you just get that partnership where it really gels. And it's clear that this is a really positive one. And he, he's just come on so much in that period, which I don't think I've seen another player bar kind of Alcaraz kind of make these sort of leaps and changes in kind of mentality to step up and and kind of really kind of cement their spot at the top of the game. I mean, it's quite yeah, interesting now because players born in the 2000s um, have now surpassed players born in the 1990s in terms of the number of slams that they have won because players who've born in the 2000s that with Yannick Sinner, that was their third slam, you know, Carlos Alcaraz as well. Uh-huh. Whereas 1990s, it's just Daniel Medvedev uh, with that US Open title and Dominic Thiem. Um, what do you what do you make of that? The fact that, you know, the 1990s players, you know, they, they were playing all those 1980s players, Federer, Nadal, Murray, uh, Djokovic. Um, and they're just they're just now, you know, they've just now been jumped by the, the young guys, uh, you know, who've been who've born much later than them. I think it's just um, not luck of the draw. I'm not. I'm not trying to take anything away luck from luck of the genes, generations. Luck of the luck of the generations. Yeah, because only if you are a '90s player, you know, you were playing that much longer with the Federer and the, the Nadal's, the Djokovic's. So I think it's it's just a, a, a factor of timing, really. Um, it's 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 obviously that they, they they can now maybe learn from these younger generation you know it's not too late for the Zverevs the Sitspasses you know Medvedev does have one slam They're level he, 28 you know, now, it's fine they've got time has a bad record in finals you know won one lost five now um do you think just, do you think the 2000s players are going to pull away from the 1990s I think so I, I would really imagine do. so I keep thinking of the Wimbledon poster you know Alcaraz and Sinner as the, the they next knew. big thing it's like their 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 prophecy was was this although I, I have seen on social media and I guess in a lot of the press you know they're now heralding Sinner as you know obviously the next best thing the Sinner mm. era that was kind of said when Alcaraz won mm. Wimbledon um and we've seen how he struggled since hasn't then hasn't won so a title since yeah how do you think Sinner's gonna react and, and handle this kind of newfound success and and expectation I mean I would say based on the fact that he has had so much good form that it would be really surprising to me if this does drop off because he talks about the fact that he is trying to get better every day. And this very much, it was when he was kind of speaking, he was so level-headed. He's just done his ultimate dream, his ultimate goal of winning a slam. You know, he's saying, right, I'm just going to try and get better each match as it comes sort of thing. And I just think that's so impressive. He's almost already, I think Darren Cahill said that he's already looking at like what he can do next. Like he's never going to settle, I think was Mm -hmm. the quote. And you feel like with that sort of attitude, I think Alcaraz has that too. Um, you're going to keep chasing these. And I think especially with the Masters series that he got at the um, end of last year and then having a great start to this season, obviously the Davis Cup, I think things are building really nicely. And I think maybe it will be a bit better this happening at 22 as opposed to like at 18 and completely out of the blue, like a Raducanu type. Or I just think it sets you up because you've had more experience on the tour, more matches at this level, and you're more able to handle the pressure and the expectation that comes with it. And it so is he going to win another... S- Ooh. Well, is he going to win say... another slam this year? I, ah. I want to. I want to get you right now. I want to get your okay. predictions. Do you think he's going to win another slam this year? I'm going to say yes. Which I, one? I, I can see. I can see Wimbledon. He's very good okay. on clay, though. He's underrated on clay, but yeah. I can see a Wimbledon one because he had that great semi-final where he was two sets up against Djokovic. I remember, um, and I think. That, that's got to be the goal for him. He has some unfinished business on centre court. Um, and the US Open, I, I'm not sure it's the best court for his game style. Mm. That would be my only sort of question. Yeah, I, 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 could, I could see him winning Wimbledon. I was also going to ask, could he be world number one this season? Ooh. You know, he seems to have Novak Djokovic's number. Seems to yeah. have stolen the thunder from Carlos Alcaraz as well. Um Do you think, could, you, could we see Yannick Sinner go that's the question to for the top Kim. of the tree? Fire back at her, Joel. Will he be number oh, one? Oh, this is how it works. Uh, I need to look at the, the actual points differences. Uh, he's got a lot of points to defend at the very end of the season, but not, I guess, as many prior to then. So yeah, I think number one would be would be realistic. I think he's going to be quite consistent. I can't see him having a big drop off, obviously barring injury and anything untoward like that. Not sure about another slam though, but I think he will 
uh, at least, you know, make mm. maybe another slam final. Whether he'll get the better of Djokovic again in a slam this year, I don't. I don't know. I'm just. I am envisaging mm. a Djokovic. Djokovic loves at. a revenge, doesn't he? Battle. Mm. We do. We do Alcaraz. seem to go. We do seem to go through this Djokovic cycle of of him having some dominance. Then he has a defeat. Then we write him off. Then he comes back. Three and, more majors uh, in a year, and he yeah. wins. Like yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, it's certainly you know there's there's certainly a lot of new stories to tell. I think to come you know later in the season. I do find it funny though. You know, it's interesting you talked about the you know the Sinner progression, particularly over the last six months, because I did I was reading like you know the first half of last season. I don't think he had won a tournament over a five hundred level or or above, and uh, it it all sort of started when. Um, a little bit like Jack Draper, he vomited into a bin, didn't he? In in Beijing, oh, wow. I believe. Yeah. And uh, it all start. It's all started from that moment. That can't be our Next new. Next time prophecy. I vomit, yeah. I'm going to think of Sinner. <laughs> uh... Well, this is, is the beginning of something great. Jack Draper. Kim. Yeah. Well, yeah. All the all the greats. They go through the. They go through this moment. It's the the vomit in the bin. I need to stop saying vomit in the bin, don't I? You you do bring it up yeah. a lot, um, <laughs> and I'm glad that maybe there's not like a visual um, aspect to that because mm. I think. I think it, I mean, that was in Beijing. So that was probably where some of the success did really mm. start in many ways. But again, it shows resilience, right? If we're going to spin it into something else um, and kind of getting into kind of the, the fitness you need to be in. Um, whereas like with Jack Draper, there's been those fitness concerns too. I think mm. with Yannick Sinner, it was the same. Um, there were questions about his back. He changed his service action. Was he able to go five sets? And I think that's a big part of developing. And I think there will be, you know, bumps along the way, or in this case, um, you know, a bin that might make for an unfortunate moment on court but it's definitely it seems to be like almost like a rite of passage at this point <laughs> I, I mean think... he does become the fifth Italian player to vomit to in a bin a grand slam no. title no <laughs> key stats, yeah, I'm key not keeping stats. tally on oh, oh on we're that, moving on yeah. we're moving on for the best I was moving away from vomit in case anyone was eating their dinner whilst listening to us um but yeah, so fifth Italian player, singles player, I should say, specified to win a Grand Slam title. Can you guys name the other four? Well, who have Panetta won? is the only one I definitely know. Mm. Flavia Panetta, oh, yeah. You uh, Schiavone, definitely. I'm, I can do double T. Schiavone, yeah, 2010 Roland Garros. Is it singles? Because I was going to say Bellelli singles. in the doubles. Okay. Um, has Bellelli won it? He must I have. Actually, I don't know if he has. Maybe I, I just made that up. He's been to some finals with Fugman. Okay. I, well, I, I don't, won't say you're definitely wrong, but I don't think you're right. Um, there's two oh, men who did it a long time ago. A court has we, been we named made... after them, right? Yes. At in Rome, um, uh, Pietro Pietro Trangeli. Trangeli. Yeah, yeah, Pietro. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that was Roland Garros fifty nine and sixty nineteen fifty nine okay. nineteen sixty, okay. and the last one Adriano Panatta uh, in oh, seventy six okay. Roland Garros. So it's in a joint illustrious group, wow. uh, third male uh, ever to win a Grand Slam. The only person to win the Australian Open, though. The only Italian singles mm. player to ever win the AO. Wow. Well, I was going to say, with Daniel Medvedev, the fact that he's become so close on, on two occasions and has ended up as the runner-up um, now at, at two Australian Opens, there's been some comparisons with the fact that Andy Murray has got five uh, runner-up plates um, in his... Uh, his trophy cabinet. I mean, what? Whose position would you rather be in? In terms of, like, I feel like Medvedev's defeats in finals have been more painful. Whereas, you know, although Murray's got the numbers that I feel like is obviously a bit is a bit long, bit more than than Medvedev. I mean, who who do you think? What, whose position would you rather be in? Do you think? I would probably say, I think Medvedev's a tougher because he has been up, mm. um, and he has had yeah. lot of chances. Whereas, I mean. Actually, having said that, it was some of the losses for against Djokovic were devastating for Murray, and he played so well, yeah. and it just wasn't enough. So it's kind of much of the same, but I think maybe it's results like this where it really could have been on his racket, which will be more painful than you know, a, a lot of losses um, Murray has in comparison. But, I mean, it's, it's such a shame, isn't it, when you have to have kind of winners and losers in these situations because mm -hmm. I think we everyone watching that final... I, we knew that someone was going to lose it, but if it was Medvedev, we're almost extra kind of devastated for him because of how much effort has gone in. And then to be, you know, if, if he had played 30 sets, maybe he would have done it as opposed to 31. So um, <laughs> I would say if you pushed me, I would probably say I'd rather, I'd rather be Murray just because I think he's a bit of a legend. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I wanted both of them to win today. I think, you know, when I saw how well Medvedev came out of the blocks, I thought, oh, he's really fought his way through the whole tournament. And wow, you know, what a way to kind of then assert yourself in the final. It did feel... Just can't win either way. It did feel rather fitting, I think, that we had a five a five set match in in the men's final, wasn't it? Because we've just had so many the most this ever. tournament, the most ever, exactly. And uh, it, it it had to. There was only really one way uh, it could have finished, and it had to be two yeah. sets down, right? Because <laughs> Medvedev had been two sets down <laughs> twice before in this tournament. Mm. Um, I, I've never seen this. This is a question I probably have for both of you. We've seen so many long matches that have been into the four hour mark. Do we think that it, there needs to be a change? We've got to go to three sets or we've got to find a way to speed it up. Is it the ball or what can we do? Because it's, I mean, I'm scheduling nightmare and also it's brutal and you can be, I mean, it's amazing Medvedev was able to stand at the end of this, but you can be scheduled and kind of out of the tournament if you have a long match. Yeah, I keep thinking about the fact that, you know, Daniel Medvedev last year was talking about like, they're only going to change the rules if someone literally dies on on the tennis court. Mm. And uh, the more and more I see... It was going to be him, is that what he's saying? Yeah, I know. (laughs) He's proving it. I see of these exertions. I'm kind of like, we are getting like, scarily like an I ultra think, towards, marathon not a tennis match anymore yeah it, exactly and it's 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 unbelievable how much effort and a number of hours potentially you could put on a tennis court um you know to, to win a to win a title personally i think they should be looking at ways to speed up best of five as opposed to cutting down to, to best of three i think there are things they can do potentially with the the balls and maybe the surface i think it has been too slow this year and maybe there's also opportunities to cut down times uh, deciding point yeah exactly maybe there are ways Mm. to do that but i think they should be looking to protect best of five at all costs because of the because of the entertainment it provides it would be a different sport wouldn't it and the separate and the separation and the distinctiveness it has to to grand Mm. slams Mm. yeah well one player who certainly hasn't had any trouble getting a grand slam of late is uh, Shea Su Wei because she has won the women's doubles title with Elise Mertens. 6-1-7-5 it was today over Kitchenok and Ostapenko who were playing their very first slam final. Uh, but Shea Su Wei, she has won three of the last four slams uh, this in the, in the past year with three different partners as well. So, Incredible. and she's also got the yeah. mixed doubles this tournament. So she's had a perfect Australian Open and she's just in this absolutely fantastic patch in her, in her career you know age 38 level 38 uh this is actually well she's the second oldest woman to win a grand slam women's doubles title after uh, lisa raymond who was only eight days older um than than sue Shea today but yeah what a fantastic um period for for her and and also mertens who we know is an absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic uh doubles player um but yeah i don't know if either of you have any comments on, on what we're seeing from Shay on, on a doubles court these days I mean, I think she's always been such a great player to watch. And I think it's great having her in these matches because she has so much variety in her game. Um, I do think, and we didn't talk about it at the time, but she was denied a singles wild card. She was allowed to play qualifying. And then she goes and wins two of the titles on offer. And you feel like, well, maybe she should have been given a wild card to play in the singles because that was her final singles match. Um, of her career but you have to say with the focus on doubles and being able to put it together with all these different partners she clearly is the person who is the best doubles player in the world whoever she plays with it seems like and it seems like her game is so great at complementing other people's games as well so um i think lisa raymond she might not have that title much longer because in eight days um i think we'll have kind of shazy way will definitely be right up there and looking mm-hmm. to add even more silverware to her cabinet yeah she's she's had her own comeback hasn't she in terms of getting back onto into the double scene and uh it's almost been the comeback of comebacks given that the titles that she's won doing it as well with different partners across the ladies doubles and the mixed doubles um i sometimes think she doesn't get the the credit she deserves because this this is seriously impressive stuff how is she not world number one though Oh, is it the first hardcore? Yeah, she's only had uh, she's well only <laughs> only had grass and clay uh, slams previously to this, but she's um, yeah, four Wimbledon's, two Roland Garros, and now one Australian Open. So she just needs to get that US Open, mm. which uh, hopefully she'll be able to do they, later this year. But there was a bit of an awkward moment uh, after the match, after the ce- the ceremony. Uh, Chris wasn't there. Tap yeah. talk us through that. <laughs> well, they were doing very well. You know, they did wonderful speeches. It was all very enjoyable. But then they actually. 
left the court and left the trophy there. They didn't take the trophy with them. Oh. <laughs> um, and so Craig Tyler actually. What, to... they didn't like it? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure because it's not, I mean, she literally had just won one. So she must have known <laughs> kind of what Too you many trophies, to do. She's not bothered. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so then he had to go chase after them because they forgot the trophy, wow. which I thought was, um, it's kind of, it's quite a bit of a flex, isn't it? You know, like someone will get it for us, you know, before we go, but you take it to your <laughs> press conference. Um, and then I think, I'm not sure how long you have it for after that, but if I did was they... the tournament, I'd be getting a lot of insurance because what if they leave it somewhere, you know? <laughs> did they did they think they had like, you know, in the, in the Wimbledon final, they have someone bring out the, the players' bags onto the court. Did they think that they had like a a designated person to kind of bring their trophy off the court. Well, sometimes there's a lot to carry, especially when you see, yeah. um, you know, these big checks as well that sometimes they get mm. in tournaments. I always just think it almost looks like they're holding like all of their shopping when they've gone and in, in, <laughs> they didn't get a basket um, as they have to kind of like balance everything leaving the court. And there's lots of people who could help. So I can understand it, but um, it was definitely a surprise that <laughs> they just walked off without it. <laughs> <laughs> well 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 we're going to take a very short break now but do join us in the second half where we'll be having a look back at the ladies final action uh, from Melbourne Park where Arena Sabalenka successfully defended her ladies title uh, plus history was made as Rohan Bapana became the oldest ever major winner so do not go anywhere Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly podcast uh, for listeners watching us uh, live on YouTube uh, you never went away, hopefully, but we're back. <laughs> you could have paused <laughs> if you needed move. a break. Yeah, if you need if you need the loo, you need to go, you know, grab a tea, that's fine. Um, steady yourself, because we're getting into the ladies' finals action. Uh, Arena Sabalenka up against Jin Wen Zheng. Uh, this was very much uh, not a classic final, mm. I think you the could opposite say. opposite of the men's final, I'm going to go as far mm. as saying. Yeah, 6-3, 6-2, just kind of about an hour and 15 on court. Sabalenka, very, very comfortable in the end. Um, Chris, what did you make overall of what we saw on Saturday in the ladies' final? Well, I, I was very pleased, if I'm honest, that it wasn't a case that Sabalenka played the best tennis throughout the whole tournament and then couldn't bring that in the final. I think that was probably the case in the US Open where she had been the form player going into that and then she kind of buckled under the pressure a little bit. So... I think she's very hard to watch when she's not playing well. And when she's playing well, it's almost not that enjoyable watching sometimes because the other players can't compete with her. Mm. Um, and I think that's what happened here where, I mean, obviously kind of Chin Wen Zhang had great kind of results to get here. Um, you know, she's beaten who's in front of her. But as we talked about before, this was an almighty step up from, you know, playing number 53 ranked Katie Bolter as the previous highest ranked player that she had played um, coming into this. So, it did look like, and I think, Joel, you did think this could be a bit one-sided. And I think mm. I, I thought it, it would, maybe there'd be a fight back and maybe it would get a bit more tricky as it got closer to the finish line. But she accelerated towards it instead, right? Yeah, it was it was very easy for Sablempa. It, it, to be honest, it just summed up her tournament. She, she, as you say, she played the best tennis. She won all the sets she played. Coco Goff gave her the the biggest challenge in that in that first set in their semi-final. And apart from that, it's been it's been quite easy. And uh, in the early exchanges against Jung uh, in in the final, I mean, I was particularly looking at how Sabalenka was was returning the Jung serve, and she was just marmalizing any second serves that came her way. Jung's first serve is is decent, but her percentage wasn't high enough, and I felt that the pressure that Sabalenka was putting on the Jung second serve it meant that she was having to go for a bit more in that first serve to uh to make sure that you know she wasn't giving Sabalenka any free points but um yeah it was it was just very easy I think in in the end for Sabalenka which was I think disappointing from a, a fan point of view because we were all kind of excited of you know or were we going to get a very entertaining tussle on our hands or and, history uh, and actually years since Nali also yeah, a bit and, of history yeah. and actually it ended in me whatsapping you both saying most disappointing mm. ladies final since dot 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 and what did we come back with yeah i said three on tech kenan maybe at the french yeah, open because yeah. you said it was the same number of games wasn't it as three yeah. on tech kenan i think it was one and four um, at that french open mm. but I which know, actually we have had quite a good a number of like really strong ladies it's been finals, a good run i guess mm. lately i suppose one juice for Jibble, that was straight sets oh, wasn't yeah. it last year yeah, that's yeah, a that, good one. that was yeah. maybe slightly underwhelming but i think you Similar know vibe yeah 
we were in a position, I think, a few years back where we were getting a lot of very one-sided routes in the final. So actually, you know, we have had some really competitive uh, affairs lately. And this was kind of, you know, kind of going back to, to the kind of disappointing vein, like mm. you said. But I mean, full credit to Sabalen, because she totally deserved this title, not dropping a set all fortnight, backing up her win last year, you know, two straight titles. She's become the first player to do that since Azarenka uh, did it here in, in 2012 and 2013. So I think, you know, for her just to kind of back it up, she's she's kind of proven mm. herself that she's not just a one slam yeah. wonder. Yeah, not to... that any of us really thought that, but I think it's just still to tick that box. It, it gives her a lot of confidence. Yeah, certainly. And I think there's maybe an argument to say that she could have she should have more more than 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 two Grand Absolutely. Slam titles. I mean, regardless yeah. of, of winning this 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 slam and I hope she does kind of kick on. But where where do you where do you see kind of Sabalenka and her? number of, of singles grand slams ending up because i would arguably say going into this tournament she has underachieved um at grand slams considering what the last six grand slams she was in she got to you know the semi the semi-final or, or, or better um mm. so she's shown that consistency and to only have you know one grand slam title to show for it um up up to the this australian open i think um you know there's an argument to say that maybe she she should be doing better there I think a bit too much yeah. emphasis is being placed on the fact that she has made all these semifinals because if you look at them individually against Mukova, for example, arguably she let that one slip. Um, she's had similar things at Wimbledon on Shabur. You were there for that one, Joel, um, I believe where yeah. that was completely edged out of it. And if she'd made mm. a few more, more balls, it would have been completely different. So mm. she could have actually got herself to the final of all of them last year. And when you look at kind of the fact that there, she has been consistent, definitely that's an improvement on what she's had previously. But then at the same time, I just keep on watching her when she plays her A game and thinking, how on earth have you not won more? Mm. Like, how are you yeah. losing to some of these girls on the tour? And not from the perspective that they aren't all very good, but she is a standout athlete in terms of what she can do. We've been talking about her for like four years or something in terms of when she will break out. So I would love to see that number get higher. Because as I've said, I only really like watching her when she's playing well. But I really hope that if she does get better and keeps improving, but then the rest of the field also kind of up their game as well. Because I think we can't have, you know, every slam going straight sets and very one-sided. So I would want a bit more entertainment on the women's side rather than her dominating it. But I can, I can see it. And actually, we asked our listeners this and the majority said, they thought she'd pick up two more slams this year, is what they mm. said. So well, well, it's 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 interesting because on on commentary, uh, I think Joe Jury said that you know power is power regardless of of what court surface you put mm. it on, and uh, you know she is going to be a threat. I think you know for for the rest of the season, and and arguably you'd say Wimbledon is is the one where you think her power can do the most. She's damage. great on so, grass. She's a fantastic yeah. doubles player. She's won doubles Grand Slam titles. Yeah. So you'd think. That would be the one that she really wants. Um, mm. And maybe that's she did want it too much last Wimbledon and the French Open. I think that has been the case. So mm. this will probably I'm, be a big relief, just absolutely brushing everyone I aside. I mean, the, the way she's conducted herself ac across the, you know, outside of, of the tennis this last fortnight, you know, she's been fun. She's been relaxed. And I think, you know, certainly with Sabalenka, the more relaxed she is, the better tennis, um, you know, the, you know, she plays. And, and as a result, she was no match you know, for anyone over the last fortnight. But um, I think it's really fun, I think, to see that that personality from her kind of shine out because, you know, you talk about players like, you know, Shviontek and Osaka, you know, you've got like those more introverted, I guess, kind of personalities. But it's really fun, I think, seeing over like this last fortnight. Actually, at the top of the game, we do also have some... I'd say very extroverted kind of personalities at the, the top of women's tennis. And, and Irina Sabalenka is almost kind of like, she's number one uh, in my book. 100% extrovert, <laughs> yeah. right? She's not shy, is she? I mean, we've seen yeah. her in Breakpoint. She's been both Did you see her when now. she walked off the, 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 the court with the trophy? And she did like a little dance down the... Uh, the catwalk. Like the... Yeah, yeah she so loved good. her. It, she's definitely got main character mm. energy, doesn't she? And I think... It's a bit different from Yannick Sinner, who's very kind of unassuming in those moments, whereas Sabalenka's Jesus, spinning like, around, I love twirling. it. I'm just gonna lord my. You can't trophy. believe that she's just oh, like. No. It's so different <laughs> to like the the. I mean, Coco Goff went live on Instagram on Arthur Ashe with the trophy. The way that people celebrate now is so different than <laughs> yeah, they used to be. Getting more radical. Yeah, yeah. I mean. There have only been four other players this century, uh, female players, to have won uh, a slam without dropping a set. Can you guys tell me and 
the viewers. I definitely know. Serena must have done it. Serena must have yeah. done it. Serena I Williams is right up there. AO 2008, Sharapova did it for sure. I remember that. That was mm. when she just, I mean, she, she bageled Justine Ennin in the quarterfinal and then six love, six four that was. And then took out Anna Ivanovic. That was a very painful slam for me because that was the Hanchikova <laughs> semi-final where she won oh, the first eight sorry, games. Chris. I know. And then she Traumatic. lost. Opening yeah. up old wounds, Kim, with these stats. I know. I know. Well, you've back. got two of Who them. else? You've got Who else? Sharapova and Serena. There's two more. I don't know. I don't know either. Ash Barty in 2022. Because oh, the Collins yes. fight, that was 7 6. She didn't go to three. That yeah. was when she realized she had completed tennis and was like, right, I can step away. That's now. when she retired, right? <laughs> Hopefully, after, Sabalenka always. doesn't retire now. <laughs> I know. I hope not. Um, and Lindsay Davenport in 2000. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. So. That's yeah. So so Sabalenka is now uh, in that illustrious group. Uh, I can totally see her winning Wimbledon US this year. Maybe not so much the French, but I think the Longer others points, are definitely yeah. mm. within her grasp. And I I see one day her potentially winning the French, just maybe not so far this year. But as for Jung, where where do you think she goes from here? You know, experience now, having been in a first Grand Slam final in the top ten in the in the rankings. Where are you predicting her to go for the rest of the year, Chris? Well, I would say on that on that point, I saw the the stats as about uh, Medvedev and losing these finals, and uh, I think uh, Ben Rothenberg actually did a tweet around the fact that you know Zverev had lost from two sets up, sits a pass in the his, in his Grand Slam final against Djokovic at the French was two sets up again. Um, and then Medvedev obviously has had this twice, and it's the idea that not all experience is necessarily good experience. And actually, it can affect you when you play in these stages again. So I'm really hoping that this is one where um, she didn't do en- her herself a disservice at all right. in this final. And I hope that she doesn't take anything negative from it. And it's actually just going to set her up so that when she does get to the next uh, the situation next, she said there wasn't really nerves, but that she is able to kind of mm. build on what she's done. Because sometimes you can see this being a not always the most positive experience when you have basically just been kind of annihilated in a Grand Slam final and you kind of still have that feeling of wanting to prove yourself at the stage again. So I hope she makes another deep run. Um, She had uh, a great run at the end of last season. She's got a great relationship with her coach. It seems like things are all kind of working nicely together. So I can see her kind of pushing further up in the top 10. I think she could be top five end of year, potentially. Really? Really? It's a bold prediction. I I, I still think kind of, the, the, this I, I, final showed this final showed to me that there's a clear difference between kind of top four and maybe you know f- I mean no like one five to ten in her. the world you know Coco didn't take a set. <sighs> oh, what do you sure. think, Kim? D- uh, decide. I mean, Coco us. got closer. Did, Coco yeah. got closer. I'd like to see more of Zhang against the higher echelons consistently because, like, I think what Joel was getting at, she Sabalenka was the only you know, highly ranked player she faced mm. this. Well, she's number night, seven so... in the world already, by the way. So we haven't she's seen not the best far of her, off but... number five. No. Yeah, no, she true. won't have many yeah. points, I guess, to defend from the, the earlier start of this year, I would assume, you know, she so did really she well at the end of last season, yeah. If she goes deep at the Sunshine Double, that's some, you know, advances in the ranking. So I'd be curious to see what she does. Uh, I think she she's gonna go up. I can't see her you know, um, going way back down again. Uh, she's definitely going to be learning and progressing. She's still so young. She's only 21. So I think we'll see her at the deeper stages of a slam again. I'm not sure if she'll make another final like this year, but yeah, certainly one to, to watch now. Now we've all seen it, much more of her game. The only thing I would say about this this ladies tournament is I don't feel like we got truly a lot of really entertaining, big, mm. big head-to-head type matchups. Mm. I think we had a yeah. lot of good we matches between eager and Re- yeah. back in going and out Rebecca early. A, yeah. yeah. We had good like big like big players versus underdogs. You know, I think about to you know Rabakina versus Blinkova and that. as well. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. But we didn't get like a lot of like as much as we kind of talked up I think the kind of the new big four of the WTA and all that and Could it looked look? promising <laughs> so early on and in in the first week of the tour it didn't didn't really feel like it it went through and yes we got Sabalenka Goff but it's sort of that first set particularly, it sort of left me being like, oh, I just wish we had a lot more of that because we've had a lot of sort of surprising kind of matchups, I think, that um, has been interesting and intriguing seeing at a Grand Slam stage. But um, I'm still a little bit like, oh, I would have loved to have seen Rabakina, Sviontek, 
you know, yeah. go 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 even deeper than they did. Yeah, and I think it, it gives like a better narrative of seeing who wins in the big ticket match as opposed to mm. will someone miss their opportunity to a lower ranked player? Like it's if- so harsh. Yeah. I know that's it's those sort of matchups. I feel like there is so much for the 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 heavy 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 favorite to um to lose here not really much to gain because everyone is like expecting right you should absolutely walk this and it's like i want to see i was sort of like hoping for more matchups where it was a little bit more on a knife edge and you couldn't really call it or, or you know look at it on a piece of paper and be like right well this person is the firm favorite and should be expected to make the next round there are almost too many especially... underdogs as well you know yeah which story do we focus on your strengths did amazingly but mm. there wasn't that much coverage because there were other stories at work as mm. well I don't know. It's it's tricky, Kim. What what were you going to say? Oh, well, I was just going to say, I think, because Rebecca absolutely thrashed Sabalenka in Brisbane, I would have loved to have seen them two meet again. Yeah, to see love what and would have three. That score. was wild. Yeah. I mean, you would, you know, you might have thought differently about Sabalenka, you know, in the latter stages of this tournament, if Rebecca was still in the game as well, based on that Brisbane final. But I think, you know, that was obviously a bit of an anom- anomalous result in, in terms of the scoreline for Sabalenka. Um, but I mean, I think for me, the highlight from the women's tournament in terms of like competitiveness and drama was that blink of a Rebecca mm. tiebreaker. You loved it, Joel. That could be beaten. That I was think the ladies, it peaked. I think the ladies' tournament, you know, peaked there. That was and... the final we deserved. <laughs> it, <laughs> yes, it was. Blink of I'm a little bit gutted for Svitolina because I, me I, too. I do wonder. I do wonder where she was going to go if she, if she. I think she could have made the because... final. I really mm. do think she could have. Yeah. Um, and that is the kind of. The problem when you have some of these big big names go out and anything can happen at any time and you know brings you back to the injury point that Medvedev made where there is a, an awful lot of tennis being played in very hot conditions mm. and there's not really an, an off season either so it does lend itself to kind of unfortunately some of these players going out um, earlier but on that point Kim of that Brisbane final do you think that having such um, what you would say I wouldn't say it's a disappointing result, but a result that isn't reflective of Sabalenka's abilities against Rabakina in the start of the season. Do you think that really made her up her game coming into this tournament? Because it almost like she's just gone to like the stratospheric in terms of how hard she's in the ball and how well she's playing. I think having a disappointing defeat like that prior to a Grand Slam can really actually help. Uh, I think a back reality to... check. Was it Sophia Kennan getting like double bageled by Azarenka before In she Rome. made the French yeah. Open final? Yeah. 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 And I think actually sometimes we do see uh, and you kind of then go into the tournament, perhaps people don't have as, as high an expectation because mm. they've seen, oh, you know, that's a bit of a worrying result there, worrying scoreline. And or yeah, and also it makes you kind of focus and concentrate and think, right, I, I, I've got to do something. I've got to... Um, make some changes here quickly um so yeah i think it you know that's the positive that you can take from that and a you bit, know yeah. sabalink has got the better deal in the end winning the ao over the brisbane title a bit like no if this video yeah brisbane. if this video episode doesn't do too well it's a reality check that maybe we shouldn't do video <laughs> 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 well well we'll see we'll see um but yeah i mean well done arena sabalenka you know absolutely deserved champion i think Ultimately, the two singles champions we've got are the two that we've seen the mm. best tennis from consistently across Agreed. the fortnight. And I think overall, they're the, the, the fair result at the end of the fortnight. Um, another, I would say, very pleasing result comes from the men's doubles. And that's Rohan Bapana, uh winning with Matthew Ebden to get uh, the Aussie Open title. Uh, funnily enough, you mentioned Bellelli earlier and uh, he actually lost in the final. Uh, talking about Italian doubles players. Um Bellelli and Vavasori, the uh, Italian pair, lost 7-6, 7-5 to Bapana and Ebden. So um, Ebden, um, Bapana is the new world number one, uh, but he has also won, finally, his very first men's doubles title at a Grand Slam, which Unbelievable. is crazy. I, I thought yeah. he would, I thought, he's, I thought he had won one already. Only he's been mixed. around for so long. Yeah, only mixed with Gabby huge. Dabrowski in, in 2017, mm. I believe, at the mm. French. Yeah. Um, I was tearing up watching this. I just... He's, we, I've spoken to him a couple of times last year. He is the nicest man I've ever mm-hmm. spoken to at any of these tournaments. We, I'm not saying that other people aren't nice, but he's above and beyond nice. So generous, so open, so so kind. And I think that's something that makes this so much more um, engaging because it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. It's an unbelievable story. And at this stage of his career, he said that he was actually thinking about hanging up his racket when he didn't win a match for five months. Fast forward, this amazing partnership where they seem to be playing fantastic tennis. 
himself and Ebden. And it's clear they love each other's company and they're just really enjoying themselves out there and the results are coming. So, I mean, what is happening in the world that, you know, we've seen all these players who are a little bit more mature having this these fantastic results. Um, I mean, he says he does a lot of yoga. I do some yoga, but I don't think I'm about to pick up an Australian Open title anytime soon. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I want to go to the yoga class he's attending. Yeah. I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's an incredible achievement. It just shows that tennis tennis is a journey. It's got ups and it's got downs, and uh, he's got incredible heart. I think to just kind of keep going, keep going, keep going, seeing where it takes him, and to win to win at this stage of his career, it's it just is so. I think it's it's very inspirational, isn't it? Because. It is. Um, you know, it, it's it's um, you know, it's almost like the un- you know, the underdog story, and now he's finally got his his moment, and um, you know, I'm really, really, yeah, really, really happy for him. And uh, just to cap some other results off, we did have Alpha Hewitt in the wheelchair singles uh, for, for Great Britain, of course. He did actually lose to Odo, who's the second seed, so 6-2, 6-4. So Alfie Hewitt not able to get the singles, but uh, did win the doubles with with Gordon Reed. I think, for their fifth consecutive AO. So um, still really, you know, positive tournament for Alfie. Uh, Joel, you'll be pleased as well. Uh, Deirdre did, did Groot won the mm. women's wheelchair singles. Uh, straight sets How many uh, in a row now. I think for her. It's, it's 16. I think it's 16. Oh, it just goes it on and on. It's incredible that it doesn't yeah. get the gain. Another thing that just doesn't get the recognition it deserves because she is just dom. She is just dominating. and been dominating for a long, long time. And I, did, did much people know about this? Probably not. No, she doesn't get the um. Yeah, the credit. The applaud it that that she deserves and uh, she needs she to... needs to get her own uh like um she needs to get her own um she needs to get her own moment uh dylan alcott moment uh, i feel on the mm-hmm. on the tennis court during a grand slam final i think or, some, or something um just to recognize her achievements because they are i truly think extraordinary yeah well the dutch doing quite well because uh schroeder won the uh quad wheelchair singles final as well in straight sets and a couple of junior results as well we had uh Jan Richkova winning the girls' singles and uh, Sakamoto winning the boys' singles. So mm. uh, two names to perhaps look out for in, in a couple of years' time. And to learn uh, how to say, I don't, I don't want to take them on. Try and transition over onto the adult tour. Yeah, I, I, Jan Richkova, I, I may be not saying correctly, so apologies. Um, Listen is correct us if we're wrong. Oh, uh, I know. Chris, Chris, I also want to say, but Lely won the Australian Open men's doubles 2015, I'll have you know. So he has got a... Grand Slam, men's amazing, title. amazing. Yeah. Well, I would like to issue a formal apology <laughs> to Bellelli. Um, yes. I believe that maybe he transitioned to doubles a bit later than that, so um, <laughs> I shall take nothing from him there. And I'm glad that he has won one because I was feeling a bit bad for him in that final. And we do have to touch upon the fact that we don't have a collector set result to give as we typically would in the finals episode of a Grand Slam because that happened earlier than usual. All of the picks Week one. lost. I'm actually a little bit excited. Fourth round. So um, Lynn, Lynn has won. Well done, Lynn. Um, the prize is, will be on its way to you. And uh, the Slam Spoon of Shame, we had given it to you, Chris, because I think yes. you did the worst on collector set. But mm. Yannick Sinner, you know, you but were the Spitalina, only one to predict it. That was, that was unfortunate, I would say. So that's in my defence. But I did predict the Djokovic upset. I'm the only person who predicted mm. one of it's the winners. Tough. So it's really tough. I think I'm out because I did best in our predictions. Joel did best at collector set. So, Kim, I'm looking at you. The Slam uh, Spoon of Shame, get... make your case. I... Oh, I predicted Chin Wen Zheng to get to the semi, so I knew she was going to have a breakout okay. tournament. Mm, okay. She actually exceeded uh, the... Do we need to put it to a vote? So... I think let's put it to a vote <laughs> on the social channels. Um, listeners, we will put it up and you can say, normally Decide when we do us. a vote, I always lose. I always get the spoon, I'm pretty sure, at the end of the day. So we'll see We'll see how it goes. But um, I, John, I'm surprised you haven't brought up that as soon as uh, Sinna won... I posted, love it when the predictions come together. And I posted my predictions with like a, a I happy dancer at the bottom. Oh, oh, which I did not do when Coco won the US <laughs> Open for you. That was just for me. <laughs> yeah, we're having I'm still words waiting, later. Uh, we're having words I'm still later. waiting for Sam Sonova to win Wimbledon. That was my oh, prediction I meant from you a few have years multiple ago. Stories we're wait- we'll be waiting a long time for that, Kim. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, well, talking of spoons, I think this is now time for the Vegemite taste test. Because I've got oh, my yes. spoon Have you had it ready. before, you two? 
No. I've had Marmite, but not Vegemite. Right. Well, um, I'm, as someone, I mean, I genuinely do have hot Vegemite. I had that throughout to lubricate the throat during this podcast to make sure that I'm speaking with velvety tones. Um, so you're gonna you're gonna have it plain, but you do a la Morgan, Morgan Riddle, just a yep. spoonful. Um, yep. How big a so spoon are we doing? Taylor Fritz's girlfriend was testing Vegemite. I've got and my I've got my teaspoon. Why we're doing this? So and I've just literally spoon like, is massive. No, it is a teaspoon. It's just the camera angle. I think oh. it's gonna make you look oh. giant. I'm, already, I, I'm smelling it for the first time now. I'm not looking forward to this already. Do you want some tasting notes to accompany it? It's got a strong, salty, sort of meaty, rich flavor. I'll be the um, judge of that. Umami. Is it it's umami? Kind of an intense tamari or soy sauce sort it's of type quite, of flavor. It's quite hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's not the same consistency of Marmite or Bovril. Um, I like the design of the jar. I think it's classic. It's a bit like um, a, a sign, isn't it? In, um, in the outback. Yeah. That I've seen. But yes. right, right. Enough talking. We've got to try it. And please, no one vomit oh, in a bit. No vomiting oh, in a bit. Oh, God. I'm a bit nervous. Okay, right. Three, two, one. That is delicious. Lovely. I'm going to go back for more. Oh, oh, no, oh no. Horrible. Really? Is it? It's quite salty. It is very salty. Yes. Oh, how can you drink this as a hot drink, Chris? Um, I used to actually also drink like vegetable stock sometimes as like a, like a light soup. That is honestly <laughs> one of the worst things I've ever tasted. <laughs> Are you joking? Oh no. That I is drink a... it's very salty, oh. isn't it, Kim? It, it is, but you don't normally just have a spoon of it. You do spread it on something. So this is a bit of an, it's out of situ. But I wouldn't say that, Joel, no. because I'm... Morgan, I'm with you. Morgan, I'm with you. We're not going to get sponsored awful. by I'm, gonna say, I'm trying to get them as a sponsor. <laughs> so everyone hold it up and smile. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful uh, veggie, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, please don't I'll listen stick to, the... to Nutella, yes. it's fine. <laughs> yes, it, it I'm has just a... going to have my toast plain. It does have a bit of an aftertaste, doesn't it? It's still sitting, oh. it just sits with you. Well... We did survive we that. There you won't be go. having a hot Vegemite with me, Kim, anytime soon. Kim is not okay. Oh, no. I need to go and have some, like, Something sugary sweet. thing to balance yeah. it out now. Yeah. Well, I'm oh. sorry that you had to do that, but I'm... Um, I'm glad just... we did it, though. I'm glad can, we did yeah. that as a group. And, uh, and, and I can expense like it. <laughs> I can expense yeah. something I already like, Joel, to the yeah. podcast. <laughs> exactly. Well, we've, we're going to end. We're going to end our Australian Open coverage there with our Vegemite taste uh our vegemite taste test uh listeners i hope you enjoyed our coverage and our social media content we've really enjoyed uh producing these episodes we've uh we've really enjoyed also the engagement the interactions we've seen um across all of our channels so big thank you to everyone um who has listened but we are going to end it there so uh i hope you've enjoyed one final time i hope you have enjoyed our latest episode of the tennis weekly podcast at the Australian Open 2024. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action still to come as we go back onto the ATP and WTA tours. I think we've we've already got what? Linz is happening, Wahin, uh, Montpellier, yes. Andy Murray, Montpellier, Yes, yeah. indeed. So it's, all, it's all back going on. On, on tour. I hope that veggie might taste will have gone by the time we do our next podcast because <laughs> it's just lingering right now. Uh, but we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all major podcasting platforms out there. So if you like what you're hearing, then do make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you like what you've heard from us over the last few weeks with our Australian Open coverage, do go and give a, a quick review because it does make all the difference to helping others find our, our work. And you can also follow us on social media. I'm pretty sure we're going to be clipping that Vegemite piece. So if you'd like to see that, we will be sharing that on social media, <laughs> whether you two like it or not. Yeah. Um, so do make sure that you check out our social channels or email the show. You can tell us how much you did not like Vegemite yourself. But we're on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok and YouTube. And the handle for all of those is Tennis Weekly Pod. You can also purchase the delightful Tennis Weekly merch that Joel has behind him. Um, there's a green tote bag, the cap, and there's also a pink tote bag. And that's at etsy.com slash shop slash tennis weekly podcast. You can email us at tennisweeklypod at gmail.com or check out our website, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we'll and we will be back next time at Tennis Weekly HQ. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. Goodbye. It's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.